welcome everyone. Thank you for coming to this session. Um, this is actually a live podcast, hence this bit of kit here, which is our backup in case anything happens over there. Um, so we are recording live, but we're not going to do the, the questions at the end live. So you can be as honest as you want in the questions and they're not going to go out to the thousands of people that will listen to the podcast. So I am Zoe Blasky. I run a podcast called The Motherkind Podcast, which I started when I became a mum. Because I'm a coach and I've been lucky enough to be in 12-step recovery for 12 years. So when I became a mum three years ago, I was looking for content that spoke to me about this huge transformation I was going through and all the triggers that were coming up for me. And I could find loads of stuff out there about what I should wear, what I should buy, which bugaboo was best, which step was the naughty step. But I couldn't find anything that was accessible and mass talking about the inner world of parenting and the inner world of motherhood. So I decided to do it myself. Hmm. And I started this podcast. And it turns out it wasn't just me who was interested in this because the podcast has been consistently number one um, in the iTunes charts. I've spoken to some incredible people and now I get to add hmm. Mandy Saligari to the list. And I am so excited for this conversation because this is exactly the type of conversations that I want to hold. These are the type of conversations that, to be frank with you, I want to get out of conferences like this. And I want to put out there to you know, normal mothers who are struggling with the triggers of their childhood as they become mums. We all know in this room that that happens. But in the world that I'm in, where that is just is not the conversation. So I'm super excited to share what Mandy's going to have to say with my, with my audience. And, and I hope that about you know, 10, 15,000 mums will listen to this. And that's a lot of mums that we can impact. That's a lot of next generation that we can, we can impact. So um, Mandy, thank you for the work that you do. Pleasure, love it. <laughs> Thank you for your book, <laughs> which I've read about four times now, I think. Um, I could probably recite it back to you. <laughs> um, Mandy, I'm sure all of you know, love and respect Mandy and her work, but my listeners probably don't know Mandy. So Mandy is the clinical director and founder of the Charter Har Harley Street Recovery Centre and a best-selling author of this book, Proactive Parenting. So Mandy... Let's start at the core of your personal and professional passion and experience, which is addiction. Yeah. And I think addiction is one of the most misunderstood behavioral challenges, probably globally. And I love your definition of addiction. So could we start there? And then I'm going to ask you about your experience with it. Okay, so start soft and then go in really hard. <laughs> Dog about you. It's not, it's not okay. my first radio. Yeah. <laughs> it's fine. <laughs> so, um, so addiction. I mean, when, whenever I've worked with addiction, people say things like, can't you find another word for what you do? Because addiction is so stigmatised that the minute you mention it, 40,000 people turn off because they're thinking, oh, I'm not an addict. Because there's so much kind of judgment and um, you know, pejorative thinking around it. And, and I thought about it. I mean, I'm not immune to that. I thought about, should I call it something else? And then I think, damn it, no, it is what it is. And I mean, I remember, I'm wondering already, I remember when I was in treatment and I was uh, about to leave. And we were talking about whether when we go out from treatment, whether we would actually tell anyone that we were an addict. And I'm like, yeah, I'm going to tell someone I'm an addict. And these people are like, why, why, why are you going to tell people? And I said, because in a way, I'm an addict, and you wouldn't know that to look at me necessarily. Um, I don't conform to the kind of, you know, if you like, the stereotype of addiction. I didn't then. I probably didn't when I went in either. So actually, I want to introduce that this is what addiction looks like, because I think that the world view needs to see that. Why would I change the name of it to conform with world view? So when I started working with addiction, the sort of simplest way that I think about it and when I talk to people is it's the simple pattern of using something outside of yourself repeatedly in an attempt to fix how you feel to the detriment of yourself. So then people say, oh, isn't therapy an addiction? And I'm like, yes, if it's causing detrimental effect. No, if it isn't. And that detrimental effect 
by the way, can be a complete abandonment of self. It can be, um, I mean, if, if, for example, I uh, can't cope with feeling on my own, so I constantly watch reruns of 24 or something, then maybe 24 does become an addiction because I am isolating and I'm telling myself that I can't be on my own. So the detriment to myself is that I need this thing to fix the feeling that I'm not supposed to have. So some of the detriment to ourselves is hidden because it's in the esteem and other stuff is really obvious. It's the physical, emotional, the erect relationships, all that stuff that we're so familiar with. But unfortunately, the esteem stuff is the rot, the debt, where it starts. That's what I want to talk about next. Go for it. Is, when is interjected. Thank you. <laughs> is the... Um, it's the core of this stuff. Yeah. Now, you talk so eloquently and beautifully, and this is my lived experience. I remember being about five, and like you share in your TED Talk, I remember thinking it's not safe to just be me. It's not safe to be vulnerable. You know, now I know that set me up for a lifetime of pain and exactly what you described. So there's going to be loads of mothers listening and parents listening to this. So I think it might be helpful to describe how that felt for you and how that then set you up to take things outside of yourself to fix how you're feeling inside. And is there anything that mothers and parents can do to support their children through that first early experiences of vulnerability? I'm Two gonna, questions. Okay, Sorry. I'm going to start with the second one first. I think um, when people come in looking for help, when parents come in looking for help, and I will say to them, so, you know, and how are you? And they go, look, look, I knew you were going to say that. You know, I'm, I'm all right. Look, I'm a bit tired because, you know, little Josie's not very, you know, she's, she's acting out. I'm just tired because of that. And I go, well, my self-care's all right. I go to the gym. I eat honestly, Mandy. I'll be all right. And I promise you, once Josie is better, then I'll put some time into me. And it's just a, it's a mixed message. So there's little Josie with mum saying, I want you to get better and I'll do myself later. So Josie's going, well, I'll do myself later then. So I think that the first thing that we can do as parents is honestly make sure that the kid can't shoot the messenger, which means I have to be in good shape. I have to apply healthy selfish, which means that I can afford to give without condition. Okay. This is where it gets interesting for me. Yes. Because... My, my mother, and she doesn't mind me talking about this, I have checked with her. She's codependent. No, no, please, tell them if it'll help. Uh, well, she, no, she has put some bandages down. <laughs> no, I'm That's kidding. not true. <laughs> Sorry. Sorry, Mum. Yeah. She and does listen to this podcast, Mandy. Okay. Um, she has put some boundaries down about what I can and can't say. So she's in recovery. She's, you know, okay. it's all right, it's all right. Um, but, but what's interesting is, so I, I meet loads of mums out there, and they, they, they who are, get that, intellectually right who doesn't get that we have to look after ourselves as parents who wouldn't get that but because of their upbringing they are codependent or have such low esteem that they struggle with that part so what I want to ask you about is what I imagine mothers will be saying is but the esteem of Josie in your story is way more important than mine but what you're saying is it's absolutely the opposite so how does someone who has never been able to take care of themselves, who may be in some sort of process addiction around avoiding themselves, do they need to go to recovery first before we can help our children? What does that look like? I think that what it looks like is um, daunting, scary, far too much, things have to be really extreme, you know, how messed up do you have to be before you see a therapist, all that kind of thing. So I think even people, even parents, mothers, okay, let's stay with mums, um, or primary carers, I think um, it's to really stop and reconsider, honestly, do you attend to your own needs, honestly? Because even thinking about it, I mean, really giving it the time and the consideration will change something. So the, the child, I mean, there's so much we can talk about here. Put it back in, put it back in. No, okay. we've got time, you okay. can go. Really? Yeah. <laughs> okay. um, I was thinking about, I, I mean, thinking about self esteem very specifically. If you were to look at uh, mothers to daughters, we know that the sense of self, sense of identity, sense of self esteem is born from same gender, it's up the same gender line. Mm -hmm. So if I want my daughter to have good self esteem, I am obliged to find it in myself. And if I will not find it in myself, 
then what's going to happen is my daughter is going to be obliged to pretend that she's got good self-esteem so that I don't feel bad as a mother and then over there in the corner somewhere privately on her own she's going to wonder why she feels so insecure. So what's important is that you start with something that's absolutely rock solid which means that I properly, wholeheartedly and unreservedly attend to me. It means I um, don't beat myself up. Uh, when I look in the mirror I'm not picking myself apart. I mean, okay, I look in the mirror and think, oh my God, you know, I'm 54, I'm not 19 anymore. What a shock. But nonetheless, that's okay. To kind of accept how you look, um, not just look at face and hair, but try and tune into, through your eyes, to how you feel. Learn how to champion, um, I don't know, being allowed to receive compliments, being allowed to receive constructive criticism, allowing people to be close, all that kind of relational nourishment. If I, as a mother, allow myself that kind of life, then I model it to my daughter, which means that when I'm not looking, when I'm just getting on with my life and my daughter is learning from me, she's learning something I want her to learn. It's all very well us consciously teaching our children things, but that is a tiny proportion of the amount of time that we're teaching them. The other, goodness knows what percentage, is spent when they're watching you. They're watching when you go to sleep. They're watching you when you eat. They're watching you in your relationships on the phone. They're watching you uh, whether you rush or whether you take your time. They're watching you when you get changed again and again and go, oh my God, I hate this, I look so fat in this. They're watching you and they are learning all the time. Equally, they're watching you when you're calm, when you accept when you're late, when you don't shame yourself or other people for mistakes. They're learning. So I think that if you establish a kind, loving, tolerant relationship with yourself, then what you are doing is not contributing to the unconscious debt that your kids will otherwise pick up yeah. in terms of model behavior. Because they don't copy what they say, they copy who we are. I mean, my mum said everything right. But, you know, she was an incredible mother in so many ways, but I, I, I saw her behavior and that's what I, that's what I copied. So, so, that's, so in, in terms of codependence, which you mentioned, mm. I often think one of the strap lines of codependence is don't worry about me, let's worry about you. I, I, I mean, at what point am I allowed to worry about me if the message is don't worry about me, let's worry about you? I mean, I'm like, <laughs> so if you're worrying about me, am I supposed to worry about someone else? So you worry about me, I'll worry about you, and everybody can worry about everybody else. At what point does the nourishment land? It's very so confusing. You, there's a hypocritical message in there. Yeah. Um, and yeah. I think it's so simple. So when people come into my consulting room and they say things like, don't worry about me, I sort of leap up with glee and go, oh, great. <laughs> and they sort of look at me like, oh no, what has happened? Because it's those strap lines that give the clues to um, where people can pay attention to make a difference to their lives. Or if they say, I'm fine, tell us about that, about connecting hmm. with our feelings and why that's important in this picture of parenting? Well, it's a lie. I mean, firstly, it's a judgment. So if you say, I'm good, unless you're Australian, of course, people say, I'm, I'm good, you know, because I was married to one, so I'm allowed to say that. So um, I'm it's saying, I'm good, um, I'm fine. These are judgments. They're measures of how they feel. I still have no idea how you feel. If I come to you and you say, I say, how are you? And you say, I'm fine. I, I don't know how you feel. But if you say, I feel happy, I feel sad, I feel irritated, I feel impatient, and I feel hungry, I'm like, yeah, yeah, I know how you feel. And I think fine first is a judgment, and then there's a let's move on. So there's a self-neglect, or there's I'm not telling you anything about me, there's a defense. And if I constantly answer people when they ask me and I say, yes, I'm fine, then at what point do I actually stop and actually think about how I feel? So when I first got into recovery, I used to tell everyone how I felt. You know when you go into the supermarket and they're like, how are you today? And I go, oh, you know, I am feeling. And then I go, how are you? And some would be like, ooh, <laughs> at me. And others would say, nobody actually asks. And I'm like, really, how is that for you? You know, so how, honestly, give me three words to describe how you feel right now. And I would ask that, and still do sometimes, of um, people. Because I want to be allowed to be uh, a living, breathing, feeling person in the world. So, and my kids do it. My kids are very good at doing it. You know, they'll come in and they'll say, don't talk, I'm really angry, it's got nothing to do with you, I'll be all right in a minute, and I'm feeling a bit sad. 
<laughs> when's supper? You know? <laughs> I'm like, great. I know, instead of just coming in in a silent mood, I'm not going to fix it. I'm, you, know, you deal with your anger and your sadness. It's not my job. But thanks for letting me know. Because otherwise, this radar goes off in the house and I'll feel uneasy because my family of origin material was there were all these feelings and sometimes they just got lashed out, dumped, you know, it was painful to be around. And then when you said to my parents, you're, you know, how are you, what's going on? They'd be like, nothing. Yeah. Oh, okay, I must be crazy then. Um, because it really felt like something was going on then. But no, okay. So I start to mistrust my instincts, which means that when I'm around people who've got lots of feelings, um, you know, I, I have to work quite hard not to feel afraid. You know, over the years, I've, I've worked on it, but like, I find it very difficult to be in big groups of people and to be around people who aren't saying how they feel. So the school gate, oh my God. It's a big trigger for a lot of mothers. The school gate, you walk in there and I'm just like, <clears throat> how long do I have to stay before I look weird by leaving? You know, it's scary. And people performing, people comparing. I mean, I find the school gate a terrifying place. I think if most got honest, everyone, there's lots of nodding. I think everyone would agree, right? Yeah. And then they yeah. find out what I do. Oh. <laughs> You've got no <laughs> friends at school, yeah, basically. I haven't any friends. <laughs> yeah, they, and they sort of say, I don't want you know, I know you don't want to work when you're coming to the school gate, but, um, or someone else will say, have you noticed that so-and-so is driving, you know, and, and there'll be a hint about somebody drink driving at the school gate or something like that. And it comes to me and I'm thinking, why does this have to come to me? You take responsibility. What are you going to do about it? Mm. It's the same applies actually, oh, we're off one one there, but the same applies to when parties, gatherings, all those kinds of things are going on and people come and ask me and say, you know, should we give my 14 year old alcohol? <laughs> Am I supposed to give my 14 year old alcohol? And I look at them and think, Okay, I'd like to see you stop them because if there's a gathering going on, they will be pre-drinking before they go. Are you not aware of that yet? 14, 15 years old, when they come in, you know, when the kids at a party with a backpack on, um, what, what an interesting piece of garb to be wearing at a backpack, at a, at a gathering. So the dude who's got the backpack on is probably divvying out something to everybody else. Invite him to leave it in the study area. It'll be quite safe left there. Hold on to it as if his life depends <laughs> well, on we, it. We, I want to ask you about that later yeah. on. Is 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 our children and and uh, all of all of that? Um, but but I just want to stay on this track to around Fine. around taking responsibility uh, as as the mothers as yep. the primary caregiver. And what uh, the, one of the parts that I absolutely loved in your book was the description and your TED talk is the description of this process of what happens right at the start of this dysfunction which because it was my lived experience and I saw it in a diagram in your book and I felt really seen and heard by it so I thought oh. for everyone listening it might be really useful to share that and that's this process of when we have this experience of it's not safe to just be me it's not safe to be vulnerable and the what, what then happens and you describe this good girl model and I wondered if you could describe that okay. for everyone because I think it's going to be super helpful because it's so at odds with what goes on out there, which is that the good girls are, are just good girls. Okay, so um, fundamentally, I think addiction is an offense against being vulnerable. So I do not want to be vulnerable at any cost. That's the basic premise. So I will um, invite all these maladaptive behaviors in order to defend against um, being vulnerable, and then I forget who I am. So what happens is, usually very simply, is kind of naught to six when the child is operating from um, not primarily from the frontal cortex, but from the kind of survival part of the brain. They are like blotting paper in water. It's like um, nature's cruelest trick, really, is that when we're all learning to be parents, our children are soaking up the most. Um, That's so, so true. And it goes straight into a part of the brain that then the frontal cortex comes online and they forget, right? So they honestly, the child will honestly believe that that is who they are because it's in a very primary area of their development. So if, I always draw this diagram, but if the child naught to six, roughly, um, experiences vulnerability in a way that makes them feel terror, that doesn't mean a big thing has to happen. It can just be that life just doesn't feel very safe. Maybe mum's yeah. very depressed 
And it doesn't even have to be the presence of addiction. I mean, it could be that dad loses his job and everything falls apart. I mean, whatever it is, but it is the, the point of it is that the child feels terror around the vulnerability. So what they do in order to compensate is what lots of other children do, which is to put on a face. So they might become helpful. So when they want to do their jigsaw, and then they see mum come downstairs upset from talking to brother, they look at it and they say, I won't do my jigsaw, mum. I'll put the jigsaw away. Can I help you lay the table? And mum says, oh, where would I be without you? Thank you so much. And the child's like, oh, OK. Do you want me to call my brother for supper? Oh, darling, thank you so much. And I go to school. And I say, I'll do tidy up time. And they say, what a joy to have in the classroom. And I'm thinking, I know who to be. I know exactly who to be here. And I adopt a persona of people pleaser, if you like. And then through my people pleasing years, I then discover being a funny in the class and I'll be a rock to people who are a bit tricky and I'll pick up the pieces. And if the new girl comes, I'll show her around. And when the parents come and they sit there and they hear such a delight to have in the classroom, such a good girl. And the parents are going, oh, thank goodness we've got one. At least, you know, we got one right because the brother's a nightmare. And the child is reinforced in this dysfunctional pattern of being a people pleaser. Now, in some ways that's okay to behave well and be nice and polite and be all those things. The tricky part is, if you're anything like me, when you put on a facade and the rest of the world believes it, I'm very happy to cancel Mandy out, stick her underneath that table and go, do you know what, you hide under there, I'll put an envoy into the world and nobody will know and you never have to be vulnerable again. And then I will add on top of my people pleasing, I will add, because the pressure builds up of what about me? She's in there going, what about me? And I'm like, shut up, don't come out, it's not safe. I need to continue to be nice to people, but periodically I feel rage and I feel overseen. So in order to deal with those feelings, I find that I mess with my food a bit. I mean, I used to bang my head against the wall. That's how I used to get rid of my um, over feelings. I would bang my head against the wall and then people would say things to me like, um, I don't know what you're doing. Why are you doing this to yourself? So on top of that, then there would be the shame and the feeling is very much that there's something wrong with me, which means you really can't come out. So I have to bury her in there. And the way I would look at it is, which is going to be difficult for the podcast people, but you are born close together, aligned with your baby self. And if you blow on a baby's face, they will react like that. And as we grow up, there's a space between the child and how you represent yourself. And it's good to have that shock absorber space. You, life is not you know, immediate in that way. You have to be able to take responsibility. But what I did is I went, forget that, forget the feelings. So I crushed the feelings and buried them. And I reinforced the kind of facade version of Mandy. And I went out into the world like this. And there was a bigger, bigger gap between how I felt and how I looked. And then sometimes when I got hold of drugs and alcohol at uh, you know, 13, 14 years old, Sometimes I would get really, really trashed and I would tell someone the depth of this feeling. I feel so lonely. I feel so bad about myself. I don't feel good enough. And the people who'd met me here would be shocked. Oh my God, I had no idea you felt like that. So now I'm like, oh my God, I really feel shame. So now I really have to bury you. So in here we have a disconnect between how I look, which has got coping mechanisms like drugs, alcohol, people pleasing, messing with my food, over exercising, working, you know, there are all the behavioral stuff, there's rebelling, there's, um, you know, my strap line all through my teen years was, I don't give a shit, I don't care, I don't care, why would I care? I don't care, do what you want, I don't care. And I told myself, I don't care, why? Because if I care, I've had it. If I care, I'm vulnerable. So I want to believe that I don't care. So therefore, of course, cocaine was my favorite drug because boy, oh boy, does that help you not to care. It also helps you to hide in the chaos of looking like you do care. You just don't give a shit about anybody else, but you're really self-centered and this kind of hiding in chaos feeling. So then you have the feelings buried here and you have this maladaptive facade. And then things start to go wrong. And I think decent treatment and decent intervention is to look at the gap between how you feel and what you look like yeah. and start trying to pick out, literally extract, some of those maladaptive behaviors. You can't take all of them out at once, you really can't, because I think people collapse and relapse, but I'd start challenging things like the people pleasing, take away the drugs and the alcohol, and then challenge a bit of the people pleasing. And when you challenge people pleasing, you're saying to somebody, um, but just, if you were making a decision about, uh, making this decision, can you put a version of yourself 
in the lineup of all the people you're trying to decide. Shall I go to dinner with this person? Shall I ring this person? Shall I drive this person? Shall I buy a sandwich for this person? You also put an image of yourself as a child because it's easier to take care of yourself as an image of as a child than as an adult. You put them in the lineup too and you say, and what do you want to do? And when I'm working with people, I will say, well, well you're not necessarily going to get what you want, okay? So don't think I'm just going to override it. I just want you to hear what you want. I want you to hear what you are compromising in favor of your people pleasing. Because I want to create a conscious conflict in you around your maladaptive behavior, which is immediate to people please, to be good, to make everybody happy, and the feeling of self-neglect, being overlooked, being taken for granted, what about me, which is profoundly shame-based because I am not supposed to need anything. So I want to introduce that dissonance that says, okay, I admit it, I just wanted to stay home tonight. I mean, I'm gonna go and do all these things, but I, I admit it. Three weeks hence, I'm like, actually it's true, I really do. Three months hence, the message is, do you know what, I am staying home tonight. Three years hence, you have, I'm staying at home, I'm going out, I'm taking care of me, I'm in good shape. So it's a process. And that's how recovery happens, isn't it? It's, it's that, my experience of it is that, is that peeling away the layers of those behaviours to, yeah. to get to the core of, you know, it's 12 years and a daily process for me still. Um, so a couple of things. How does a parent know, listening to this, going, oh shit, I've got a good girl, she uh, does everything that I want. She, how does someone know whether they genuinely have a child that they've parented brilliantly and is, is very cooperative and happy in the world, or they've got someone that you're describing, which is that they're adapting themselves to, to increase this distance between who they are and who they're presenting to the world. How on earth does a mother who's not a therapist or in recovery, what do they, how, what do, they do with that? Okay. Tricky question, sorry. No, no. I, I, think, think, I like to okay. think what my audience are going to be thinking. Okay, I think that it's, um, it's got to be age appropriate as well. So that okay. if you kind of settle in your ages sort of up to eight or nine, the sort of nine to 13 or 14, 14 upwards, those sorts of things. First and foremost, when parents come and say, um, how did we get here, right? The answer is a large dose of denial. That's the answer, because there will be an abundance of clues that have been written off to things like, oh, she only gets drunk when Izzy, when she's out with Izzy, or she only did that because she was tired. So the first thing is, are you writing, for, actually the very, very first thing is, please don't have a knee-jerk reaction. That's the first thing, it's very important. Don't listen to this podcast cast and then have a knee-jerk reaction. Um, percolate. Hard to do if you're not connected to your feelings, but okay. Uh, and that's my second point, very good. Um, <laughs> Don't have a knee jerk reaction. Let the dust settle in your own world. Allow yourself to be curious about what you've heard and what you're thinking and what you're feeling. If you feel changed by hearing podcasts, TED Talks, things like this, allow the information to percolate through you first. Digest love before you give it away. Digest information before you start trying to give it back to someone else. Give digested versions, not undigested versions first. So allow it to settle in you first. Second, no knee-jerk reaction. Third, um, it's age appropriate. We have more agency, if you like, over little ones, but older ones might present in different ways. But the most important thing um, above spotting the clues for clues, rather than writing them off uh, in a denial process of it was only once, everybody does it, all that kind of stuff, is the assessment tool is you. You know your children better than I ever will. I can work with your child for two years and I will never know them as well as you know them. You know your children. I know this illness. You know your children. So when a parent feels de-skilled, out of touch with, terrified by uh, what they're seeing, what they're suspicious of, all those kinds of things, it's the parent who needs the help, not the child. Clean up the assessment tool. Clean up um, the parent's ability to um, recognize when they're projecting their own losses, their own fears, their own expectations onto the child. Um, maybe they are, um, maybe they recognize talent in the child that they were never able to realize. I mean, there's a, a, a yeah. gazillion things that they could be doing. Yeah. Clean up the assessment tool that is the parent so that when they are sitting in a room with another parent, with a friend, or with a therapist, whatever, they can absolutely hand on heart say, this is my stuff, the rest must be my child. 
that's the work. Now, if the child is older, if the child is a teenager, then you might want to um, bring them in because you are worried about them. And most of the time, honestly, most of the time parents are right. When they have a gut instinct that there is something wrong here, they're usually right. The bit they miss is that there's something wrong might be about them. So when I launch Charter... Hard to hear. Yeah, sorry, but you know, if we all want to... It's good. If we, we all want the same it. thing, we if we all want it. the same thing, we have to have the humility to know that we're involved. I'm involved in my children's upbringing. I mean, I'm, I'm a recovering addict. I'm a single working mother who is divorced, right? Um, and it's all on me, and I have to work with that. I look at the mistakes I make all the time. My kids sometimes say to me, you should know better, you're a therapist. And I just think, well, the gift is that at least you know that, and you're able to say that. Um, have you ever worried about any of your children? Of course. Of course I worry about them. Do you then over worry because of the knowledge you have? I, I am honest with them about the potential that I will over worry because of the knowledge that I have. <laughs> and um, That's good to hear. That's you know, and hear. I say to them, look, I, I have to tell you that when you go um, AWOL, I'm thinking, you know, France, stolen car, bloke, coke, alcohol. Because that's what you did, right? <laughs> <laughs> and my daughter's like, I was on the common, you know. How old are they? Just so um, 12, 16 and 19. I'm okay. like, I go there. I'm like there. They've taught me not to. Um, and I'm like, okay, that's great. You are not me. And a very wise teacher said to me, they have different parents to the ones you had. So um, the thing about the kids, though, what I was going to say is that the parents are often right. So in 2008, when I launched Charter, um, I think probably maybe 15% of my client group was a sort of 16 to 20s. Now, over 75% of my client group is that age group, um, and probably 14 upwards. And because I've got such a large presence in the independent school sector, um, I have a lot of teenagers who come to me, and they will come after the talk and they'll say, can I have a session with you? I've got all these different things, but really I want to talk to you about my mother. And I say, bring your mother. And then they will come in, and the mother will say, I'm so worried about so-and-so, and the child will be like, Mum, I need to talk to you. I'm like, OK. So the child might go and get sorted out, go to treatment, or they might go through some sort of treatment process, but so does Mum. And what yeah. happens six, nine months down the line is that the relationship is transformed. So if you can have the courage to realise that you're involved in the dynamic that you might be worried about, if that child wants to do nothing about it, you can still do something about it because you can clean up your side of the street. You can take responsibility for the part that you've played with your hand on the tiller that's guided that, and you can let the other person know that they're responsible for the rest. I mean, I think it's a respectful process, depending on how old the child is, but, but the thing is, most of the time the parent's right, but they're not always right about what's wrong. Yeah. But they're right that there's something up. Yeah. Well, all this stuff doesn't come from nowhere. That's what I want to translate. You know, yeah. It doesn't come from nowhere. Yes. Yeah. Um, okay. But it goes further back than, I mean, my children's stuff goes further back than me. It goes with my parents and my parents' parents and my parents' parents. Yeah. This is not about I anybody. I always say this. It, I have a dynasty behind me of um, but it's not dysfunction about and addiction. No, and of course people not. say things like, you know, I don't want to talk ill about my parents because I feel protective of them. And I say things like, well, you're protecting them from how angry you are, not from me. You know, if you didn't feel that you blamed your parents, you'd be able to look at their ingredients. If you honestly felt that there was no judgment and no blame, you'd be able to go in the larder and go, yep, that's dad, that's mum, and that's what happened to me. Oh, how interesting. But you're going in there going, no, can't talk about mum. And I'm thinking, well, why? It's because of your judgment of those ingredients. It's not mine. There's one thing that changed this for me is that about five years into my recovery, someone suggested that I go and ask my mum about her childhood. And that it was it was amazing because the compassion that came from that because I was like of course you didn't stand a chance either yeah um, so I think that's really important about taking the blame away so so we've got about 10 minutes so there's some more questions that I wanted to ask Go you that it. might just dot around a bit so so bear with one that I know um, and a couple of people have asked me to ask you about is uh, technology and screen addiction and um, what the hell? What do we do? Um, how, how do we know when someone is addicted to te technology? When is it age appropriate to give someone a phone or a screen? I, I know everyone's going to really want your view on this because I Let get me asked keep loads it and I don't have an simple, answer. Then. I'll try and keep this really simple. 
Um, I honestly don't think that any child should own their own technology when they're operating from that survival part of the brain. Zero to okay. six. No, they don't own their own. So zero okay. to six, zero to seven. They shouldn't own their own technology, full stop. Because if they do, when you take it away from them, you're hitting into their survival area, right? Yes. So you're going to take away something that they're going to be like, I can't live without that. And that's because that's the part of the brain that's playing with it. Well, they and can loss borrow, aversion is coming into play. And well, they can borrow family stuff. You can borrow mum's phone for, and so you borrow a phone or a piece of kit for a time limited, outwardly stated time limit. So you can have it for 15 minutes to watch Peppa Pig because you like it. So you tell them that they can use, they can borrow it, time, what it's for, because. So you teach them right from the start what this is all about and you give them the boundaries and they won't argue with you if you teach them that and then you graduate through giving them a little bit more agency at every stage okay so um, that's the first thing the second thing is I think all parents should have access to their kids accounts assuming that social media accounts yeah okay. assuming and this is the big difficult assumption that all parents are capable of being boundaried when they access their children's accounts and that comes back to why the parents should also take a look at themselves but in principle in an ideal world we should be looking at our kids sort of 12 to 15 whilst they're bobbering around in the safe harbor near enough to us on the beach to go and fix them if something terrible happens but far enough away for them to gain confidence that they can handle this incredibly potent influence in their lives it's there it's going to be there they have to learn how to handle it Therefore, what we want to be teaching them is the relationship between the kit and them. Now, if the parent overreacts to use of phone, use of gaming, whatever it is, will you get off that bloody thing? It's ruining our lives. I've had enough of this and all of that. All the kid learns is mum's a nightmare, dad's in a bad mood. They don't learn anything about being agitated by the kit themselves. So what you want to be able to do is to be in good shape yourself so you point out that the child is getting very agitated in this relationship, that the child is unable to stop when they said they were going to stop and the child will try to bait the parent to overreact so they can displace the healthy shame of uh, not maintaining the boundary onto the parent who then blows and then everything can be lost in the drama so firstly teach them okay. from a very young age around ownership time use and so on graduate gently whilst overlooking cook gently um, whilst overlooking what they're doing and be able to intervene at certain stages, seven, eight, nine, yes. Whilst they're 13, they're going to have a lot more independence. You're not going to comment on their social media or anything, but you're going to watch. You wait to see if they communicate with you. Um, and when you intervene on any kind of screen use, you have to keep your dignity. It's really important. What does that, that you, mean? It means you stay cool and calm. If you are going to go okay. and intervene on a kid who's supposed to have come to tea, and he hasn't come because he's still playing Fortnite, and you storm into that room raging, you've already not only lost the battle, but you've contributed to the uh, connection between technology and your child. You've given them a point. So they go closer to the tech further from you. From you. Get so it. you want to stay cool, want to stay okay. calm, and okay. you want to be able to say things like, I think it's a real shame that I've called you for tea, and we're all sitting up there having tea, and you clearly prefer to be on Fortnite. And then you don't stand there with a big target on you going, and oh, give me back what you're going to say. You turn around and walk out. I leave you to cook with your healthy shame, and I trust that that will teach you. <laughs> and when they come upstairs and say, oh, I'm so sorry, and you don't not feed them. I mean, God, some parents said to me, so what do they get? No tea? And I'm like, so what happens next? So they get no tea, child comes up and says, terribly sorry, and the parent goes, good, 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 they have tea, but they go to bed, and then at 9.30, they're like, I can't sleep because I'm hungry, and mum goes, come down, let's make you some pancakes. And you're like, that really backfired. No, you, what you do is you take supper, you cover it in cellophane, you leave it in the middle of the table, the child comes up and you say, there it is, I expect you to sit there, no phone or anything at the table, sit there, eat your supper, it's cold, I'm really sad that you prioritised Fortnite over a family tea, it's a shame, isn't it, turn around and walk away. I will let shame and my disappointment and my wish that you respect me teach you. I want that to teach you. I'm in it for the long game. Why? Because the relationship with screens is connected to the big guns of drugs and alcohol later. So when you've got screens in your home, you want as parents to welcome it as an opportunity to put one in the bank on your side against drugs and alcohol before they even march into the ranch. Because next time it might be booze and coke. Because if they are dissociating in their yeah. screen use, yeah. believe me, I have never yet met an alcoholic who feels themselves getting pissed.
they have a drink and they dissociate and the next minute they're shit-faced. Yeah. What we want to do is keep people connected in their using so that they can feel the impact, so they have a nat's chance of taking responsibility for what happens next. Okay. And that's on us. Okay, that's so helpful and important. And, and before we go to questions, because, because that mother that you were describing, um, who is able to walk up calmly as dinner is being ruined, and expect, you know, that is someone who is self-aware, that's someone who can hold a boundary. So I just wondered if we could finish by talking about boundaries. I couldn't let this end without going into boundaries a bit more. So if someone never learnt boundaries, someone might even be listening to this going, what the hell is a boundary? Um, how, and how does a mother who didn't get taught it, has never had inner or outer boundaries, how do they learn? Do they have to go to therapy to learn how to hold that boundary with their children? Oh, do you know, when I hear you say, do they have to go to therapy? You see, I think, <laughs> have to, How sorry. Do, they have to go? do you have to go to therapy? I'm thinking, I love therapy. It's my, so so it's do my, I. It's my, it's my lovely love hobby. But, but not everyone listening will feel the same as us. No, I know. In this room. Yeah, but they're wrong. But it's okay. <laughs> <laughs> it's okay. So, um, so I, think, I think that boundaries, I mean, people talk about putting up a boundary, and I think, oh, no, you just put up a wall. Boundaries and that, all that language is all about control. I actually think that boundaries are the kind of automatic external representation of how you feel about yourself. So that's yes. powerful. Hang on, let me just. So, so boundaries are a rep representation of how you feel. Yeah, about they, yourself. they are the external representation of how you, how feel, you about feel about yourself. yourself. You know, when you're in the room with somebody who's got boundaries, you feel it. You feel respect. You can feel it. They're clear. Yeah, they're I mean, kind. yeah, and they're not trying to control anyone else. You know, assertiveness. Is, is representing myself, aggression is trying to control you. You know, it, all I'm doing is representing myself. It's up to you what you do with what, what happens next. But I'd like the opportunity to speak. And that means that I know that my I matter to me. And I think that if you want, if, if you are thinking, I don't know what a boundary is, my child doesn't respect me, um, I have no control in the home, I mm -hmm. feel walked all over, mm -hmm. um, I, I'm me. losing track, I don't yeah. feel like a good enough mother, all of those things. Um, I would say to you, take some time out for yourself. And you know, if you look on Google and you looked up, you know, ideas for self-care, let's just say, and there's lots of posters and things there, you know, hundred things you can do that are good self-care. Could listen do them. to some of my episodes. Yeah, lots and of just self -care. exactly do them because I think self-care, well, self-esteem is self-care in action. Okay, self-esteem is self-care in action, and boundaries are the external representation of that self-esteem. I, I matter, I don't need to take up more space or less space than I need that's be in this world. And, and that's it. And if you are my children and I am responsible for you, we need to work together with that stuff. So if I'm consistent and clear and I'm honest and I take care of myself and I'm in good self-esteem, I think we are already halfway there. And I don't expect More my kids. Halfway, I don't expect my kids to agree. I mean, I don't expect them to like me for it. You know, they're off the hook for that one. But well, there's your people pleasing. Mother, and if it? I, you know what, people say I want to be a good mother for my children, and I get that. I really get that. I want to be a good mother for so my children, I. but I really want to be a good mother for me because when I go to bed at night, I want to be able to put my head on the pillow and think, you know, well done, Mandy. You did a good enough job today. That's what I want. And it isn't dependent on my children sounding like the Waltons and all saying good night to each other. They all slam the door and go into their rooms. As long as I know that they're all kind of. I get it. Oh, yeah, I see why you're in those places. And I feel all right about me. Then I get a good night's sleep. And, you know, that's as important. What a way to end. Thanks, Mandy. Thank wow. you. Thank you. Thank you. Round of applause for Mandy. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> all right, so we have 15 minutes of this incredible woman in front of me to um, answer any questions that you have. This will not go out on the podcast, so please you know, say your name, say as much as you want about yourself, a situation or a question that you may have. It, it will stay <coughs> in, this, in this room. So I think we've got a roving mic somewhere. We don't have a roving mic, sorry. Well, we can repeat the question. Yeah, I, yeah, I, can, I can do that.
she was aware that she needed to look after herself and it manifested in quite a strange way um, and she actually said to me and I probably was about 10 or 11 she actually said to me I'm not your mum after 9 o'clock and I think what she meant was that she needed to have that time to herself to think about her own needs but I think I don't think it taught me healthy boundaries I think it taught me that my needs were only important for 18 hours um, so I'm just, I guess I'm just wondering, for someone who's already a mother and they're kind of trying to look after themselves more and taking that on, how does that look in a more healthy way? Than Great. That? You hang on, really hang on. Did everybody point. hear the question? Great. Okay. You raise a really, really health, a really good point actually, which is, you know, this idea of I'm not your mum after nine o'clock because that's my me time and all that sort of stuff. When I talk about self care, I think that's really painful. Um, and I think that um, what I say to people is, to mothers and, um, or to kids, who say, I hate my mother, I hate my father. I say, you can put a bucket on your head and go and live in Timbuktu, but I'm afraid that is your mother and that is your father, no matter what, 24 seven, that's it. Um, so it's not true either. Um, so the self care I'm talking about is not big spa days or big gestures or, you know, at, at nine o'clock I want to have a glass of wine because that's what I need. It's about um, banking things as you go along. It's my phrase, bank it. If it's good, bank it. You know, somebody smiles at you in the street, smile back and bank it. Um, this is where the gratitude lists really kick in. I mean, I believe in writing gratitudes, 10 gratitudes um, every day, just write things down and it gets beyond the big things and it starts being, you know, the, the smile you had in the street or, you know, the exchange with the person in the supermarket. And I think that the kids need to see things like, um, so you've just been kind to yourself, so you're running late, and instead of being in the car going, oh my God, oh my God, we're gonna be late, you go, oh, shit happens. <laughs> you know, sometimes we're late. Tell me about your school. We're gonna bank this time, the HP moment is, given that we're gonna be late, and I'm sitting with you, I have a moment with you. So it's the attention of bias on what we do have. It's banking all the little things. And when there's, you know, one cake left, um, you don't always give it to your kid. Your kid goes, do you want it? And you think, actually, do you know what I do? <laughs> yeah, I love that one, thanks very much. Ooh, delicious. You know, and it's not always me and it's not always you, but I matter too. So I think there's, there's the idea that as a mother, you're supposed to defer your needs 24 seven. It's not the case. You are representing an unhealthy model for yourself, which means you put all your needs on hold, which means you get backed up with all these urgent needs, which then become stressed and da 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 da. And you're not teaching, you know, little and often. So I think little and often and lots of nice things happening that you bank. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah, I was just, I'm just, I really enjoyed this and I think you both have said a lot of important things, but I'm really noting, and I went back to the program to think maybe I had misunderstood, but I you dads are so conspicuously absent in your conversation. And I think in terms of things like showing vulnerability and emotional vocabulary and modeling Yeah, I mean, I, I should probably answer that. It's partly my fault because I started something called Motherkind. So I do tend to focus on mothers, and I and I led Mandy um, in wanting to talk about that. Clearly, fathers are really important, and my actual hope and dream is that someone starts something called Fatherkind. I have asked that. I keep saying my passion is it, my my Motherkind is my passion. I feel like it's my calling. I am called to work with mothers and talk to mothers. It doesn't mean that I don't absolutely recognize this is a joint parental responsibility absolutely but what I'm doing with my with my content and platform is speaking to the mother my, my hope and dream is that someone you know it's 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 another gap like it was when I started mother kind can I add on to that though because I'd agree and right at the start when you said that I said okay okay let's focus on moms, yeah. but primary care I was I was leading you for it's sure. fine but the but I would say and I um, is that um, what I always work with is same gender self, esteem, identity, who am I? Opposite gender, um, how do I translate into the world? So once I know who I am, how does, that trans how does that translate? How does that realize into the world? How do I access my potential, all those sorts of things? Opposite gender, and that's older siblings as well of, the, of, the same, of opposite and same gender. So when I'm taking family histories, I'm always looking at older than you, genders and adjectives to describe because we find so, much, so many clues in that. And sometimes I'll find, um, which is a real case, I had a mother who 
uh, brought in her daughter who had been to several different schools very bright girl um, and she constantly um, ended up being bullied and mum said look I'm really happy to do therapy and so on and I did an interview with the daughter for about 20 minutes and I realized this girl had good self-esteem wanted to do a profession she was pretty solid in herself but there was something about how she translated into the world so I said to mum really sorry I don't need you I need dad in here oh you won't get dad and I went well can I just have his phone number and uh, <laughs> rang him and I said I just want to have a quick comment if you wouldn't mind swinging by I shut the therapy door behind me stood in front of it and said have you got half an hour and uh, discovered this history whereby his um, his sister had died uh, when he was young, somewhere similar to the age his daughter had been approaching. And so he'd reacted very, very badly and violently, actually, to his daughter's emerging femininity and vulnerability and all of that. And, of course, she had then reacted defensively, so she didn't understand why, given that she felt good about herself, when she translated into the world, everybody hated her. So we did four sessions between mother, uh, daughter and father, and the whole thing has resolved. I did more work with father subsequently, but uh, it was extraordinary, and it was like um, emotional chiropractic. If this is translated into the world, opposite gender, bring it in, do the work, go back out, see how it works. So yes, both parents are, are important, not just because we would say men need to show their vulnerability and men blah, 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 but because both of them are potent inputs for the makeup of the child who needs to be able to look in the mirror, see mum, see dad, and see the evolution of those in themselves and be okay with it. So yes. Thank you, important point to raise. Gosh, we've got loads. How on earth do we? How on earth do we choose? Um, you, you seem very, very keen. <laughs> Defiant. No, I mean, I think that people's, I'm cur forever curious, people's relationship with control. Okay, so either I will comply or I will defy. And the compliance is the people pleasing and so on, the defiance, but, but what you're looking at there is you're looking at the presence of control. And you're looking at the child's reaction to the presence of control, and that will probably be modelled by something. So we often see defiance when the parent, same gender parent, no, sorry, we often see defiance when the opposite gender parent is micromanaging because the, the world is getting too far into their stuff, so all they can do is go, get off me! And that's the defiance. I can't take anything because there's no agency and there's no space. It's relationship with world. So um, I would think about it as relationship with control. Doesn't matter if it's defiance or compliance. The point is, it's not healthy. Okay. Same sex, we're looking at um, the esteem identity issue. It'll be about respect. Say that again. The, the, the male, the child, will need, um, well, I would strongly recommend that the child has a close male figure who is a godparent, something like that. They need the male model in there as well. Okay, we've, we've probably got time for two quick Robert? questions. Yes. But that wasn't sufficient. Mm. What do you make of that and that type of rehab? Okay, so um, beat a cushion, called mother to get your anger, feelings out, right? Um, I don't think it's helpful. Uh, I'm always saying to people, this is not about getting your feelings out, it's about digesting them. And I think a lot of rehabs get you to purge feelings because the instant fix is tears and emptiness and you get this kind of, oh, that was great because I've just blamed, I've just you know, raged and I've got it out. But the next thing that happens in my experience is it all just fills back up again and I need another purge. So actually what I'm going to do is to try and help you get in touch with those feelings and then you need to figure out where they're going to sit in you because they're not going anywhere. This is part of your human experience. You're going to have to digest it. Sorry that shit happened to you. What an awful thing. However, you're going to have to deal with it. You have got to find where to file it and mine it for usefulness. So no, I'm not, I'm not an advocate for purging emotion, punching things, getting things out at all. I think you need to get it to a point of dissonance and then sit with that discomfort whilst you're proactively working with the clues that come up. 
Thank, Thank you. you. Super clear answer. Thank you. Um, okay, one last question. Thanks. Yep, yep. Oh, thank you for saying that. I'm coming at it a little bit at a different angle, but how can corporates support working hours? Oh, yes. Because I can actually improve staff, but I can't work hours myself. Both are passions, right? Yes. I mean, the three <laughs> quick and easy things. One, this is a reparenting model hidden under the proactive parent title, so you can internalise any of this stuff in terms of your relationship with yourself. Um, I think that... Uh, what can corporates do? One of the things that corporates do is they can make a space. Like when I, I did something in the city recently and I said I challenged all the corporates in the room to set up a, an anonymous meeting in one of those little rooms in the basement of those be beautiful be buildings in the city and have an anonymous, a fellowship meeting. Even if it's emotions anonymous, it doesn't have to be Alcoholics Anonymous or CODA or SLA or any of those things. It can be EA, which is a relatively um, unheard of um, fellowship which is access to all, it's how do you deal with your feelings, how do you take responsibility for your feelings. And I think that in corp when I started doing work in the city, I met with one of the bosses from the big bank and he said to me, um, I love the work you do, but he said, I, I really don't want everyone going home at six o'clock on the dock to do their yoga. He said, I, you know, is that what you're going to do? And what he what? And I get it. It's bloody commerce, right? Of course it is. What they want is to have the good bit of the addictive streak without the burnout. So what we're trying to do is to address <laughs> the burnout. So and then right. I, I like high achieving. So you know, you've got to be able to reach your performance without being shamed as some kind of overworker or something. But as long as the consequence isn't, you know, the detriment isn't there to yourself. So I think we're looking at taking responsibility for how you feel, confronting the corporate structures for their overtly aggressive patterns of behavior so that there are other subtler and more sustainable ways of growing business and relationships that come through that are invested in good self-esteem, boundaries, emotional interactions, and get fellowship meetings in every single corporate in the city. Here, here. Because they've all got a little room downstairs yeah, that nobody uses. Right. And we all love those little dark rooms with no light and, you know. <laughs> We love it in there, just stick up sort of thing on the wall and everybody get real. We don't need much. <laughs> Cup of tea. <laughs> thank you. Thank you, everyone, for listening and for your questions. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.